Welcome to yet another video where I will present a compilation of four scary stories. I noticed most of you haven't even subscribed, so if you have enjoyed listening to this video please consider doing so, to be able to enjoy such videos on scary stories regularly. Or else, I'll send a demon dog to haunt you when you're alone at night. Anyway, with that being said let's start with the stories. Road to Another Dimension by Reddy underscore Welder 2877 Some of you may be wondering, given the title, if I actually did travel to another dimension. Let me give you the story of my experience. My brother, along with my friends, are now gone, killed by those, things, as I can only describe them. I just wish, I hadn't gone down that road, then everything would have been normal. I just wish, it was all just a nightmare. But it was all real. Very fucking real. Before I tell you what happened, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Steven Mendoza, and I'm currently a student who's studying at the University of Hawaii on the Big Island. I was just a normal person, majoring in liberal arts and attending history club. My brother, Daniel, was also part of the club too, even though he majored in psychology. He and I, along with a large group of friends, got together most of our free time, eating at a cafeteria while talking about our lives in the mainland to some local friends we made. They were taken aback as to how different our cultures were, and tales of Native American folklore, in comparison to Hawaiian folklore. But enough of my background and life story. I suppose you're now wanting to know about that road I'm talking about. Well, for starters, it exists. If you see a road with a sign on it that says no Hawaiwaho, then I strongly suggest you listen to that sign and turn back. I certainly will now, after that horrifying experience. The experience that lead to my brother's demise, and those things. I will not forget their faces, their bloodthirsty faces. Those creatures, things, whatever you wish to call them. I just wish I never let my curiosity get the best of me. It all started, when my brother, along with my friends, Darian and Robert, were on our way, to a bar to drink, a bar Darian told us about. Of course, Darian couldn't drink, he was the designated driver of course. Sucks to be him I assume, ha. Huh? Even though we were on our way to the bar and following the path that lead to it, I felt that we may have gotten lost, somehow. We're not familiar with these tracks, but luckily, one of our local buddies were. He said that the bar is just a few miles away, but there's a road that's long and curvy that leads to it. We didn't see any other, quicker option to the bar we meant to head to, so we decided to just drive off. The pathway eventually lead us to a hill, with trees surrounding both sides, obstructing the view of the full moon, as well as the ocean. As I continued driving, I caught a glimpse of what looked like a bright rectangular object, in the distance. As we got closer to it, I realized it was a sign. On that sign were two words in Hawaiian, No ho i wa ho. No ho i wa ho, I said. What the fuck does that mean? I then asked. My friend, Darian, told me what it is and pronounced it right. It means, stay outside. Stay outside? But from what? Is this a private property? I asked myself these questions as Daniel looked at the GPS on his phone. It was very interesting to see that this roadway is not visible on the GPS map. Robert had a regular map of the island and pointed us to where we're at. To our surprise, this road was not included on that map either. The road appeared to be off-grid in some sense, and I noticed that it was a long roadway that almost looked like a shortcut to the bar. Come on guys. I said. I think it could be a shortcut or something. Darian however, was not happy. Why the hell do you think that sign is there? It could be some kind of top secret military facility or some shit. 
Let's not go through there, he said angrily. My brother, Daniel, was taken aback, after looking at the Google satellite images on his phone. Guys, there's nothing there at all, he said. We all looked at his phone, and it clearly showed the road we're on, but no road or buildings on that particular roadway with the sign. Then I guess that's just an old roadway and something used to be there. I said. Nevertheless, we all just wanted to get to that bar. Since there were four of us, there needs to be at least three people voting to go through that road. But if two against two, we need to discuss this once again and vote again. I know, I know, it sounds silly. But I just wish there was a fifth person with us. We did ask our other buddy, Michael, if he could join us, but he unfortunately refused. So as we all voted, it was decided whether or not we should take that roadway or continue down the long route. Of course, I decided to let my curiosity get the best of me, when I voted along with Daniel and Robert, against Darian, who would rather take the long route. He wasn't happy, but we all voted to go anyway, whether he liked it or not. I now damn my curiosity, and myself. Thus, I decided to drive us through that roadway in front of us. Moments after I drove into the road, I suddenly felt this chilling sensation. It's the kind of feeling you get when something is wrong. Guys, I get that terrible feeling something is wrong here. I said. Daniel and Robert laughed, while Darian kept his mouth shut and looked down. Only after a couple more minutes have passed, I felt like I was suddenly about to pass out. I looked to my brother along with my friends, and they were surprised to see my reaction. Stephen, are you alright? Daniel asked me. Even though the car was staying on the road, I felt like I was about to pass out. Stay with us, Stephen. Robert said anxiously. Just then, I suddenly felt my mind go dark, and I blacked out. I could hear my brother along with my friends screaming at me to wake up, before everything went quiet. I cannot completely recall what I had seen during my blackout experience, but I did recall this one particular vision in my head. I saw, my brother, along with my friends. They, were being torn apart and eaten, by these shadowy looking things in front of me. I was in the car alone, and they were outside, being mutilated by these things. I was horrified, about to break down in tears. Just then, I heard my name to the left of me. Stephen. It whispered. I looked to my left, and saw something I wish I hadn't. It looked like a female entity. It had a blue face, along with red eyes having no pupils or anything visible. Just red. It smiled at me with its sharp teeth, and then broke my car window, snatching me out of the car. That's when I woke up. I slowly began to hear everyone in the car screaming my name. I then looked at them as I slowly became aware of my senses and my vision. To my shock, they all looked like they had seen a ghost. Stephen, what the fuck happened to you? My brother asked me. I don't know. I just suddenly passed out, is all I could think of. No bro, you were still driving perfectly fine, but your eyes looked like they rolled in the back of your head. Daniel said. That alone made me wonder, did something happen to me? I felt shocked, no explanations for what happened to me. Nothing. Even though Daniel was a psychology major. He would pass this off as something to do with the brain. However, even he looked surprised to see that. After a few moments, we suddenly reached a clearing, that by all accounts, should not have existed. I drove as far as I could, only to see we were in a different place. To the right of our car, there was a huge lake with what looked like trees in the distance. But to my most shocking surprise, I looked up into the night sky, only to see that there were much more stars than there should have been, and the moon? It still looked like our moon, but it wasn't glowing a white color as usual. Instead, it sported a purple color, and I was amazed, but also terrified. What the fuck did we get into? 
I turned to see if my brother and my friends could see the same thing. Daniel was looking at the moon as well in shock. I gotta be dreaming, he muttered to himself a few times. Darian and Robert felt the same way. I then asked Daniel to pull out his GPS, to see where we ended up in. Daniel, was astonished and terrified. The GPS is unavailable. It's not showing anything. Are you sure your phone's not working properly? Asked Robert. My phone is definitely fine. Daniel then explained. But this means that we're not even on Earth. We're nowhere near any location that the GPS registers. After hearing this from Daniel's mouth, it rendered me speechless. He's after all, a psychology major as I said. To see him freak out about this, means we are truly in another world. As we began to ponder on the events happening before our very eyes, I noticed a building far off in the distance. There. That could be it, the bar. I said happily. But Darian nodded his head no to me. I know what the bar looks like. That's not the bar. Then what is it? I suppose the only way to find out, was to get closer and closer to it. That's why I thought at that very beginning. I just wished I turned back the moment I saw that building. As we got close enough and got a good look at it, I noticed something was off about it. The sign on that building, didn't seem normal at all. In fact, it looked like a language that was completely alien to us. If you remember seeing those vampire symbols from the first Blade movie, or those symbols in the second Transformers movie that Sam Witwicky was drawing while unconscious of his actions, you'll get an idea of what we were seeing. Guys, I don't fucking like this. Let's get the fuck out while we have the chance. Darian yelled out. But his words fell onto deaf ears, words I should have taken to consideration. It was only for a few moments that we got to look at the symbol. Then suddenly, without any warning, figures started pouring out of the building, looking at us. When my brother Daniel looked at them, he said they looked like ordinary people with bloodshot eyes. I'm guessing they smoked too much weed. I jokingly stated. Robert and Daniel was cracking up at my joke, only for Daniel to stop laughing as the figures began to approach us. That's when Daniel was about to scream when they got close enough. They, didn't look human at all. They had human-like features, but these things were far from human. They all shared the appearances of that same female entity I saw in my vision. As they got closer, they stopped and looked at us for a few moments. Hello? My brother asked. One of the figures walked up to the car window, and then proceeded to lean down. That was when we saw its face, for the first time. We all started screaming. The figure then looked like it was sniffing something, but its nose seemed to bend in a way no human-like nose would do. Then it smiled at us, revealing sharp, carnivorous teeth. Then in a split second, it broke the passenger window and snatched my brother out. I was horrified at the sight. I was about to get out to rescue my brother, only to turn to my window and see, that very same entity from my vision, smiling at me. It broke my window and snatched me as it did in the vision, revealing sharp teeth, with black tar-like liquid coming out of its mouth and dripping onto my face. As I broke out from its grip, it then slashed at me. That slash came in contact with my shirt, causing a rip on it. My friends all got out of the car and attacked those things, trying to save me and Daniel. But to my horror, I saw my brother, being torn apart and eaten by them. I was shocked and in tears. Darian snapped me out of it as several other figures started approaching me. Get back in the car and get the fuck out of here, he yelled. I did as he said, as he and Robert desperately fought off the creatures, only to be overpowered in the end. Then Darian looked at me, one last time, in his final moments of life. Leave, he yelled. This time, I didn't stick around. I listened. In my rearview mirror, he and Robert started getting torn apart and eaten. 
I felt like I was about to vomit, but I had to hold myself together and drive the fuck out of there. The only way I could get out was the way we were heading. If I head back there, they would rip me apart. I noticed another roadway surrounded by trees. I drove through there, hoping like hell it would take me out. It took a few minutes until I finally reached the end. As I drove off, I saw the sign again, surprisingly. But this time, something was completely off. The sun was dawning, and the moon was white and fading in the morning sky. I could see clearly, the same sign, only now, there was no road. It was just a forested area next to the sign. No roadway, no way in. Nothing. I began to think this was all just a terrible nightmare. However, looking in my car, I saw on one else in it. Just me. I stopped, and got out of my car. I could see dried up blood on it. That's when I realized, to my horror and sadness, it was all real. Very real, in fact. Not to mention morning. Have we been gone for hours? It only felt like an hour or two, wherever we went. A driver spotted me. He noticed the blood on my car and thought I got into a horrible accident. He called 911, and I happily anticipated for the response team to arrive. While waiting, the driver pulled up in front of me and asked if I was okay. I did not know what to say, but I also had no logical explanation. After telling him what happened and that we meant to head to a bar, he laughed and thought I was crazy. Am I correct to assume you guys drank too much? He then asked. I would laugh, but I know for certain I'm not drunk, and I was too horrified and shaken up to even laugh or joke about it. This was fucking serious. A police car arrived. The cop came out and began to ask questions. The guy who spotted me, chimed in. I think this guy drank too much. He said he saw blue things come out of a building with weird symbols, and rip his family and friends apart and start eating them. Of course, that was part of the explanation. The cop found it funny, but had to take it seriously. I was being serious, and told him everything that happened. I even showed him that sign with the forested area, and told him there was a road there last night, and we went into it. Both the driver and policeman saw the sign, but they both thought I was going nuts. I was arrested under suspicion of drunk driving and negligent homicide, and perhaps, even murder. After arriving to the police station, I was being interrogated of the incident, so I told them everything that had happened. Of course, the cops didn't want to believe me. But there was one policeman, the chief himself, who was surprised at my story. Of course, my suspicions were confirmed when he then asked me this one question. Was there a full moon that night? I then recalled what I saw that night. Yes. I did see a full moon, along with an ocean. We went on top of a hill that appeared long and curving. I said. I see. The chief said. He might as well be innocent, the chief then told the others. Wait. What? Asked the cop that arrested me. How the hell is this guy innocent? There's blood on his car. I thought it was going to be the end of me at that moment. I'll be in jail for a murder I did not commit. Since you don't believe me, I suggest we have this young man take a lie detector test, as well as few psychological tests, and get a measurement of breath from him if he's drunk. From what I'm seeing, he doesn't look drunk, the chief then explained. What's that? One of the cops noticed, looking at me. He walked up to me and saw something on my face. He rubbed it off, and saw that it was that black, tar-like substance. Not to mention the tear on my shirt that was clearly visible. The cop then instructed me to give them the shirt, while they hand me a new one. They also took the black substance for testing. A few hours have passed. After going through the tests and passing all of them, I was let go. When I returned to college, Michael was happy to see me, but his smile dropped when he saw my face. 
Dude, are you okay? Where's Daniel and the others? Did they head home? But no, I explained and I told him everything. He thought I was crazy, until the chief of police shortly arrived. Steven Mendoza, correct? He asked. Yes sir. I said. I'm sorry we haven't met. My name is Keala Hoopiai. I'm the chief of police for the Hawaii Police Department. The reason I came here is because I wanted to inquire you about the events that took place. I then asked why. Because I believe you. I believe you're telling the truth, young man, he then told me. Michael's eyes went wide and fearful I was telling the truth. As I thought, he asked us to come with him into his car. While he was driving us to the location, he revealed to us the following. After reviewing all of your tests and studying the substances in your shirt, it was clear to us you were telling the truth about your experiences, and you were completely sane and sober. That black substance that was on your face, was of unknown origin. But not only that. The reason I believe you is because, something similar happened years ago, to me. That one statement from him, made me realize once again, it was all real. My sister and my best friend were with us at the time. They never made it back. But unlike your friends who have been torn apart and eaten, they were turned into them. Me and my other friend were the only ones who made it out, the chief continued. He then took out a picture of himself, his two friends, and his sister, and upon looking at it, my eyes went wide with fear and I felt my heart pounding rapidly. It was her, but human in the picture. When I saw her that night, she wasn't human at all. She looked like those things. I was horrified. You saw her, didn't you? Keala asked, and I looked at him and nodded with tears rolling down my eyes. She was the one who left that substance on my face, and gave me that tear on my shirt. I said in a whimpering voice. The chief then looked down, and tears rolled down his eyes, having received confirmation that his sister is truly, one of those things now. That picture was her final picture. It was taken a couple of hours before it happened. It was heartbreaking to hear, this is her final picture with her friends and family. We approached the site, with the sign still being there. Do you see that sign, Michael? Keala asked, and Michael nodded in approval. I'm going to tell you and Stephen hear this warning, and I need you both to consider it. Do you understand? He asked both of us, and we nodded in agreement. In the time of a full moon, a road manifests here. Never go through it. Keala instructed us. We nodded in approval once again, and he drove us back to the campus. I will never forget that night. It's a night that will forever haunt my memories, and my dreams. I still see the face of that woman, whom she looked as a human, and how she looked now, as one of those things. The thought of such things that can make one's blood run cold just by turning into one wrong lane. In time, my family back in the mainland became aware of the story along with my brother's death, and I explained everything that happened. I'm not surprised they somewhat believed me, as our family is known for talking about the various folklores and certain beings like skinwalkers and ancestral spirits. They also grieved over the death of my brother, and I blame myself for having taken that road in the first place. Now. I will never forget the instructions the chief of police gave me. I will never forget the clear instruction of that sign. No ho i wahoo. Stay outside. The Man Who Lives in the Hollow Oak Tree by Arushas. None of us believed him. How could we? It was just so odd that it couldn't be true. I swear to you that it happened. I can't prove it, but I swear to you it happened. We all just kind of shook our heads, but the look on Rogers' face should have been proof enough that he was serious. He looked almost haunted, like the sight would never leave him. 
Roger is a habitual drunk. He manages it well for work, but he's been a drunk since I met him in college. Not a social drinker or a fun drunk either, but a hardcore alcoholic. Like I said, he keeps it under control so he can hold a job down, but from quitting time till he passes out, Roger is drunk and in his own world. The story he told us happened in the park last night, and the way he told it made me think he might be stone sober while he told it. Roger had been off that day, so, of course, he'd headed down to McGrady's at 11 just as the other day drinkers were starting to sober up. He drank his lunch, met us for shots after Ryan and I had gotten off, and then left about 8 when the bartender told him to stop smacking the jukebox or get the hell out. Roger, very drunk at that point, had staggered out and gone to the park across the way. He intended to sit for a minute and wait for his head to stop spinning long enough to pick up a fresh bottle and start drinking at home. I was sitting on the bench near the little pond. You know the one across from the hollow oak tree. I had nodded, knowing just what he was talking about. The hollow oak is kind of a landmark in our town. Guys from the agricultural college had tested it a few years ago and determined that it was 80% hollow inside. They were at a loss to say how it stayed up or in the ground, but it did, and people sometimes came to take pictures. The city had set up a little chain perimeter around it, and you weren't supposed to touch it or disturb it in any way. So I'm sitting there, watching the sun go down and night begins to settle when I see this guy come out of the tree. We had asked if he meant someone was sleeping at the top of the tree or at the base of the tree, but Roger just shook his head and repeated that the guys had been inside the tree. It's like, he had floundered for the words, remember when you were a kid, and you played with Play-Doh? You had that thing that would squeeze the clay through a little hole and make, like, spaghetti? Well, it was kinda like that, except so much worse. He said it had started with an arm. At first, Roger had just thought it might be a squirrel or a bird, but when the fingers gripped the bark, he began to think he might be hallucinating. The arm pulled itself out of a knothole, and pretty soon, a pale shoulder was sticking out too. The shoulder stretched and turned, and when a head followed, Roger said he almost screamed. He was certain he was hallucinating now, sure that the sauce had finally cooked his brain, but he doubted even his mind could create something like this. The tree pushed the person out, head and shoulders and knees and toes, and the man had hit the grass on all fours like some kind of spider. He scuttled across the grass, under the chain, and when he got to the edge of the barrier, he started making gagging noises. As Roger watched, the man had thrown up a dozen small somethings and then scuttled to the other corner of the barricade to do it again. He had done this three more times, up chucking into each, and when he looked up from the fourth round of this, he had made eye contact with Roger. The man's face, he said, had been confused but not afraid. He was looking at something unfamiliar, and when he smiled, Roger felt his breath catch in his throat. The man's teeth were pointed like a bunch of sewing needles, and the look had been far bigger than Roger's pickled brain could understand. The smile looked painful, too big like he could have swallowed me whole. Roger had run then, ran all the way home. That's where we'd found him last night, passed out on the floor and mumbling in his sleep. I finished my coffee and told Roger that he'd better get ready if he wanted a ride to work, but Roger said he wasn't going today. He told me to tell the boss he didn't feel well, and I told him I'd meet him at McGrady's after work. He had shaken his head at me then, mumbling about how he'd never be back at the bar again. I think, he said, his voice shaking like a leaf, I think I might be done with the sauce for a while. I rolled my eyes and left for work, expecting I'd find him drunk when I got to the bar that night. When I got to the bar at 6 o'clock, however, he was nowhere to be seen. The bartender said he hadn't seen him all day but asked me to remind him that his tap still needed settling. I asked a few of the regulars, and they said they hadn't seen him either, so I stepped out of McGrady's and found a familiar shape sitting in the park. 
I walked up to him and found him stone sober as he sat on the same bench he had told me about in his story. Have you been here all day? I asked, Roger just nodding as he stared at the tree. I had never seen Roger this way, and it kind of scared me. I had seen him sober before, and I had seen him drunk plenty of times, but this was different. He was like a different person, someone who's seen something he can't comprehend, and I felt sorry for the tumult that must be going on inside his head. You were serious about that creature, weren't you? I asked. Roger nodded, his eyes boring into the tree like they meant to melt it. I wanted to walk away, but I found myself sitting beside him instead. My morbid curiosity had gotten the better of me, and if this creature was real, then I wanted to see it myself. We sat like watchers in a theater, waiting for the show to begin. It wasn't a short sit either. Six became seven, seven became eight, and as eight became eight thirty, we watched the sun sink lower and lower. It was high summer, and the days were long. Just before 8.30, the sun became a burning coal on the horizon, and the two of us tensed for what might or might not be about to happen. As the darkness settled over us, I sighed. Good one, Roger. Got me to waste my whole afternoon on this nonsense. Come on, I'll buy you a drink, and you can have a good laugh at how you... But he grabbed my arm then, pointing at the tree with a shaky hand. I looked back, and a long, pink worm squirming its way out of the knot hole. It's just a worm, Roger. You got drunk and hallucinated something that scared you. I'm glad you're using it as an excuse to get sober, but don't ask me to buy into your delusion. Does that look like a worm to you? He asked, his voice shaking. I glanced back and saw that it, indeed, no longer resembled a worm. The worm had become five, and they were attached to a pale pink hand. The hand had unfurled from the hole like some alien flower, and as the wrist made its way out, I realized that the show had begun. The wrist emerged, and behind it came an arm and an elbow. The shoulder was next, and as the tree sprouted a man, I found myself unable to look away. He came slithering from the knot hole, this boneless creature in human flesh. It was like watching dough being pushed through a press, and I wondered how I could possibly do this. When the head came free, it looked like nothing so much as a helium balloon being inflated. How? I gibbered, my mind refusing to understand what it was seeing, how can this be? If Roger knew, he never answered. The two of us sat mesmerized as we watched this fully grown man come sliding from a gnarled opening too small for a squirrel to fit into. He hung from the opening when it was down to his legs, a caterpillar ready to slide from his cocoon, and he hit the ground on his back before flipping over gracefully and scuttling on all fours towards the little chain fence. When he opened his mouth, a spray of small somethings came spilling out onto the ground. They were black, looking like the smooth river stones you sometimes buy at the hobby store. He threw up about twenty of them before scuttling to the other corner. He repeated this operation four times, and as he opened his mouth for the fourth time, I saw the double row of pointed teeth in his oddly large mouth. He looked up after seeing us, and, just as Roger had said, he smiled before scuttling back to his tree and pressing himself back into the hole. It was like watching a blow-up doll deflate in slow motion. First, his arms, then his shoulders, then his head, then his legs, and before long, his feet were disappearing grotesquely back into the cramped little opening. By the time he was done, it was almost nine, and I felt as though my brain had been awake for days. That probably sounds weird, but when you see something like that, something that just doesn't make sense, your brain tries its best to make it fit into the picture of the world you know. Birds fly, fish swim, and this man compresses himself in and out of trees so he can throw up. I stood up then, and Roger grabbed my arm. Don't do it. If you look, you won't be able to stop yourself. I pulled myself away from him, wanting to see what it was. I needed to know. Why did he come out to throw them up? 
Were they bugs that were killing his tree? Were they some kind of sickness that he had to keep purging? Why did this thing that defied logic come out of his tree just to throw up these, whatever they were? I bent down, taking out my phone as I shone the light on the pile closest to us. I gasped, I couldn't help myself. They were acorns. Solid black acorns that were about twice the size of a normal acorn. I reached down to pick one up, but my hand froze before it could touch it. I stood up, wiping my hand despite it having touched nothing, and offered to buy Roger a drink anyway. After what we had seen, I thought we both probably needed one. No thanks, he said, getting up to go, I think I'm done drinking for a while. Maybe, you ought to come home too. We ended up heading home and just watching TV for the rest of the night. Roger hasn't had a drop of alcohol in a month, and I still find myself dreaming about that strange creature once or twice a week. It will fade in time, but I want to get it down here so other people know. Given what happened yesterday, it's information that people might need. You see, the news reported that the hollow oak was gone. No one had seen it go, but the patrons of McGrady's had speculated that it must have been between midnight and 5 m when the bar closed. Many of them had seen that old tree when they came inside but reported that it was gone when they left at 5 am, the ones who could remember it. But never fear. Local botanists have reported that a small sapling has already sprouted in the spot its predecessor occupied. There is no evidence to suggest that it might also be a hollow oak, but this reporter certainly hopes so. I'd like to say that this was where it ends, but, unfortunately, there's a little more. You see, I couldn't get those strange acorns out of my head. I kept thinking about them, wondering about them, so the night before the hollow oak left, I went and watched the man as he went about his strange and disgusting ritual. Once he had gone back inside his tree, I went to the pile and took one. I put it in my jacket pocket, and now it's sitting on my desk. It seemed to draw my eye, the little acorn almost appearing to beat like an infected heart, and my mind tells me to plant it in the ground. Roger told me that if I touched it, I wouldn't be able to help myself, and I guess he was right. I don't know how much longer I can stop myself from planting it, but I fear what might come tumbling out of it one night if it grows. So, if the hollow oak lands in your town, don't touch its strange occupant's acorns when he comes to deposit them. I wouldn't interrupt his strange ritual either, not if I were you. The occupant seems harmless, but all those teeth must be for eating something. If you enjoy listening to stories like this, I'd like to let you guys know that if you have any spine-chilling crazy stories that you want to share with the listeners, you can send it over to horrorexperiencemedia at gmail.com. I'll also have the link down below in the description so don't worry, you will be able to send your story after you've finished listening. Ma's Diner by quite underscore contrary 77. Hannah, a recent graduate from nursing school in Temple, Texas, was driving home from college to move back in with her parents. Her original plan was to move in with her boyfriend of two years and work at the large local hospital there, but she had caught him sleeping with another girl. So, her plans changed. She wanted a fresh start and she knew the hospital in her hometown would give her a job. Her parents were great and immediately offered to let her move back home until she could get back on her feet. Hannah knew the way home by heart, but she was still using her GPS on her phone for traffic. Which seemed like a good idea. There was a traffic closure alert for the highway and GPS was telling her to take an alternate route. She had never taken this highway before. Hannah loved exploring new places, so she thought it would be a fun little adventure. Anything to avoid traffic. After a few minutes, Hannah realized that no one else had turned off when she did. She seemed to be completely alone on the road surrounded by forest. That's weird, she thought. 
maybe they just didn't see the closure on their GPS. Hannah drove about 30 more miles and came into a small town called Mighton. I've never heard of this town before. Hannah said aloud to herself. But she just shrugged it off, knowing that Texas is a big state and there are lots of small towns she's probably never heard of. Hannah saw a gas station and pulled in. She had noticed she was running a little low and decided this was a good place to fill up her tank. She noticed the gas station and everything else in town looked like it was taken right out of a photograph in the 1960s. Everything was clean, but just old-fashioned. Even the people milling around seemed to have an old-fashioned sense about them. Their hairstyles and clothes looked nothing like today's standards. She hardly took notice of the fact that there were no other cars around. As Hannah opened her door to get out and pump her gas, a tall, lanky young man about her age approached her vehicle and stopped her. Afternoon, ma'am. I can fill her up for you, he said kindly. Oh, that's not necessary. I can do it myself, Hannah tried to get out of her car again, but the man blocked her way. He didn't seem threatening, but she knew he wasn't going to let her pump her own gas. Here in Mighton, we pump the gas for the ladies. I'll take care of it for you, Dot. He said politely. Say, this is a neat car. I've never seen one like it. Where'd you get such a fancy car? Hannah sat back in her car, defeated. She handed him her card. My parents gave it to me. It was their old car. They got it at some dealership. You've never seen a Chevy Malibu? No, ma'am. I can't say I have. I don't get out much and we don't get many visitors here. And I'm sorry, we only take cash. We don't have those fancy machines. Oh, no problem. Here you go. Hannah said, handing the man enough cash to fill her tank. She made sure he also had a little for a tip. She was a little bothered that he had never seen a car like hers. It was a very common car. Okay, you're all set. The man said once the gas was pumped. Great. Thanks. Hey, is there anywhere to eat around here? I'm getting kinda hungry. Hannah said through her open window. Yeah, Ma's Diner. It's about a block down. You can't miss it. It's the best food in the whole state. The man said, rubbing his stomach for emphasis. Hannah grinned. She loved roadside diners. She and her dad would always try to find the best ones on road trips. Thanks. I'll try it out. Hannah said excitedly. Tell him Hank sent you. The tall lanky man said, grinning. Hannah waved and drove the block to the diner. It looked like a typical 50s diner. Large windows with booths, a long counter with padded stools bolted to the floor, a jukebox in the corner. The kitchen could be seen from the dining area. There were a couple of milkshake machines behind the counter. A couple of young waitresses were dressed in poodle skirts and white button-up collared shirts with their hair in ponytails. Hannah thought they really nailed the 50s diner theme, but something just felt a little too authentic. One of the waitresses greeted Hannah at the door. Hannah requested a booth. Her waitress's name was Susie, according to her name tag. When Hannah told her that Hank sent her, Susie blushed. Hannah got the distinct impression that Hank and Susie were a couple, or would be soon if Susie had anything to do with it. Hannah ordered a bacon cheeseburger with onion rings. She was still upset about her ex and didn't care about the extra calories. She noticed another customer, dressed like he was from the 50s or 60s, like everyone else except for the waitresses, getting a milkshake and decided she had to try one. Hannah knew her dad had a soft spot for milkshakes and he would want to know if it was any good. So she asked Susie for a chocolate milkshake to go. Hannah paid her bill, again with cash, and got back in her car. She got back on the road after checking the GPS, 
confirming the directions, sipping the delicious milkshake. Twenty minutes later, Hannah saw the welcome sign for Mighton again. Then she saw the gas station. Hannah slammed on her brakes. Everything around her was different. Instead of a clean, beautiful town, everything looked like it hadn't been touched in fifty years. No one was around. Hannah sat in the middle of the road for a full five minutes, trying to comprehend what was going on. She picked up her phone to check the GPS again, but it said, no signal. Hannah tried to call her mom, but it wouldn't work. She even tried to call 911, but it wouldn't work. She threw her phone on the passenger seat in frustration. Hannah drove to the diner and parked in the same spot she had been parked earlier. The windows that had been clear and pristine just an hour ago were now so black and grimy that Hannah couldn't see through them. Weeds were growing through the pavement and cracks. There were a few small businesses lining the street that were now shuttered. Hannah decided this couldn't be real. She pulled back on the road and drove back onto the highway. Twenty minutes later, she was back in front of Ma's diner. She tried to leave again, only to find herself back in front of the diner twenty minutes later. She drove out again, this time going slower, looking for a turn off and holding her phone, hoping to catch a signal. But there were no other roads and no phone signal. Just the forest. When Hannah found herself back in front of the diner, she let out a scream. She got out of her car, slamming the door. Hello? Is there anyone out there? Hannah yelled hopefully. There was no answer. All she could hear was the usual cacophony of insects and birds that was normal for this part of Texas. Hannah started to walk around the small town. She discovered there were several abandoned houses. She couldn't bring herself to go inside any of them. The town was small enough that a person could walk through it in 10 minutes. The town was surrounded by a thick, dark forest. It was starting to get dark, so Hannah went back to her car. She didn't know what else to do, so she read a little from the current novel she was reading, and finally fell fitfully asleep long after the sun set in the driver's seat of her car. Hannah woke late the next morning, her car covered in shade from the diner front. After walking around for a few minutes, she opened her trunk. Her dad had always made her carry an emergency kit in her trunk. Some water bottles and snack food. She always thought he was a bit ridiculous, but now she was grateful. She pulled out some water and a couple of granola bars. She sat on the curb in front of the diner and slowly ate, trying to figure out what to do. She thought about hiking out, but she knew she was miles from anywhere and she didn't have proper hiking equipment or a real compass. Hannah explored the town a little more for a while. In the afternoon she retrieved a blanket out of her car and spread it out on the grass in front of a house. She was lying down staring at the clouds, her book forgotten next to her, when she heard a new sound. It was another car. She jumped up and ran to the road to flag the car down. To her surprise, the car was already slowed down. It then pulled into the diner next to her car. A young man about the same age as Hannah slowly got out of the car, looking very confused. He kept looking at the diner. Then he looked around and saw Hannah. Hey, wasn't there, he started. A diner? Hannah finished. Yeah. So you saw it, too? Um, I thought I did, just, like, 20 minutes ago. I ate there. They had great burgers. But how is that possible? And how did I get back here? He asked. I don't know. I've been asking myself that since yesterday. The same thing happened to me. I'm Hannah. She said, reaching her hand out for a handshake. My name is Jack. Hey, wait. I know you. I've seen your pictures all over the news for months. Jack exclaimed, returning Hannah's handshake. What do you mean for months? 
I've only been gone a day, and I haven't been on the news. Jack nodded, more assured. Yeah, they said you're missing. Your parents have put out a huge reward for you. They said you just seem to disappear off the face of the earth, his voice trailed off as he looked up at the diner again. I left temple yesterday and stopped here for gas and food. I spent one night here. No, the news said you've been gone for around two months now. You went missing in May I think. Jack said assuredly. In is May, Hannah said, frustrated. Hannah, it's August 7th. Jack said softly. No, it can't be. I've only been here a day, Hannah's voice trailed off. Her eyes filled with tears. My parents, they must be so worried. What's happening? I don't know. Let's try to get out of here again. Let's go in my car. Jack said, gently guiding Hannah to his passenger side door. Hannah numbly got into his car. Jack tried driving out the way they came into town, but 20 minutes later, they were back in front of Ma's diner. They tried a couple more times to no avail. They eventually gave up trying to drive out and decided to explore the town. With Jack by her side, Hannah felt brave enough to explore some houses. They were completely empty aside from dusty furniture and a few knickknacks. A huge surprise was that everything worked. The electricity, the appliances, and the water. But there were no phones in any of the houses. Another surprise was when Hannah found an old wedding picture in one of the houses. She was confident the couple was Hank and Susie, but the picture was old and faded. When sunset came, they found a house with a set of twin beds side by side and talked until they fell asleep. About midday the next day, Hannah and Jack were sitting in front of the diner when to their surprise another car pulled up. It was a young married couple in their late 20s named David and Shauna. They described a similar experience as Hannah and Jack. Their GPS had directed them to this small town due to traffic. They had stopped to eat at the diner and had tried to drive on just 20 minutes earlier, only to return to the diner. Hannah and Jack told them it was pointless to try to leave, but David insisted on trying a few times. They were running low on food and were starting to get worried about what to do. Hannah only had so many granola bars. The others had a few snacks in their cars. But it wouldn't last much longer. They all went to bed that night slightly hungry. They awoke the next morning to a surprise. There was a large black box sitting on the curb in front of Ma's diner. Jack ripped it open and found food and other necessities they were lacking. In a note. Jack read it aloud. More will come as needed. You will be provided with all you need. Your job is to start a town of your own and live your lives peacefully. Forget the past. Embrace the future. Every newcomer is chosen for a reason. I will see you soon. Regards. AHP. AHP? Who the heck is AHP? Jack asked angrily. No idea. David grumbled, taking the note from Jack and reading over it to himself. What does he mean every newcomer is chosen for a reason? Shauna asked. Well, he said to start a town of our own. I'm a nurse. I just graduated. What are y'all good at? Hannah asked, looking at the small group around her. Jack smiled. I cook. I grew up helping in my parents' diner. And I'm a police officer. David said. And Shauna was a waitress, but she quit because she's pregnant. At this, Shauna beamed and rubbed her stomach. Hannah and Jack congratulated the couple. So, Jack. I guess you can cook in the diner and I can take care of any minor injuries. And David, you can help people when they come into town. You can help them get settled. Does that sound good to everyone? Hannah surmised. Everyone agreed. I will try to get bedding washed in the houses. 
Shauna volunteered. Sounds great, Hannah said. I'll help with that. Jack and David moved the large box into the diner and Jack and Hannah began cleaning the kitchen. David and Shauna went to find a house they liked and started cleaning it together. Midday, another vehicle showed up. David took the new resident under his wing and explained everything to him. Jack prepared a great dinner for everyone to enjoy. Hannah helped to serve it. There was no denying there was a spark forming between Hannah and Jack. With every new resident, they learned that another two to three months had passed. Strangely, the weather in Mighton did not seem to change. It was still perfect spring weather. After a while, there were about 60 residents and even some pets. The houses were nearly full. The boxes were still coming. Despite many efforts, they could never catch who was leaving the boxes. They seemed to appear out of thin air, much to the surprise and dismay of the residents. One day, the new citizens of Mighton were milling around Ma's diner, waiting for another new person to arrive when, to their astonishment, a short pudgy man wearing wire-rimmed glasses and a bowler hat and walking with a cane came walking into town from the forest. Jake and David, who seemed to be the non-elected leaders, jumped to their feet. Good afternoon, sir. Did you get lost? Did your car break down? David asked. I'm David. This is Jake. David held out his hand for a handshake. The man looked up kindly at David, and then at Jake. I see you followed my orders. Thank you for listening so well. The man said jovially. I am Ambrose Horatio Pendleton. Hannah froze. H.P.? She muttered. Ambrose's gaze flitted to her. Yes. I am the one that sent you that note in the first box. I'm glad you were paying attention. Ambrose smiled and put his finger to his nose. Hannah suddenly felt anger rise up in her. You didn't give us much choice. You took us away from our families. Our lives. Our homes. We want to go home. Let us out of here. Why are you doing this to us? How are you doing this? Just let us go home. Hannah yelled, becoming more frantic, with each sentence. Ambrose just stood there calmly, a small smile lifting the corners of his mouth. Oh, my dear. That's just not possible. You're in my world now. Ambrose turned away from Hannah and faced the entire group. In one of my infinite time loops. You will never leave. You will soon forget your old life. You will continue to age. You will have children. You will die. But you can never leave. Your children will never leave. The mighton you saw before is still alive today, it is just close to you and the rest of the world. I gave you a small glimpse. And one day, your town will be shown to some new visitors. Take care of them, just like you were taken care of. Ambrose turned back to Hannah. Don't worry, my pet. All your worries will be forgotten. Ambrose muttered, walking up to Hannah and brushing her cheek with the back of his finger. Hannah jerked away angrily and went to stand by Shauna. Shauna put her arm around her shoulders. They both began to cry. Ambrose turned and walked back into the forest, ignoring any more questions or complaints yelled at him by the group. A year later, Ambrose's word had come true. No new cars had shown up since his arrival. Everyone had forgotten their old lives and everyone had found what seemed to be their soulmate, unless they had arrived with someone already. Hannah and Jake had been married by the preacher Kyle and were expecting a baby in a few months. David and Shauna became parents to a beautiful baby boy, Isaac, delivered by Dr. Peters and assisted by Hannah. Dylan and Caleb, a recently married couple who had been on their honeymoon, loved coming in and decorating everyone's homes. Everything anyone needed would arrive by a large black box. Or the carpenter, 
Bryson, would build it for them. More babies were born. A school was eventually started. All of the cars were parked in the garages and never used. The town was small enough that everyone could just walk to where they needed to go. Life was great in the little town of Mighton. One day, a strange, futuristic-looking car showed up. You and Me, Always Forever by Disco Dingus It was Jenna, my sister-in-law, who told me I'd mourned enough, in a matter of words, and that I deserved to find happiness in the arms of another. I shouldn't have needed her approval, though it did help. The guilt I felt at finding another man even remotely attractive was unbearable at times. But Jenna was right, two years of honoring Ash's memory was more than enough. Ash was my husband of three years. Is it was? We're not divorced. Correct terminology aside, Jenna and I are still very much family. Her opinion on the matter meant a lot to me. Ash was taken from us in an act of violence, a hate crime that also left me close to death. We'd been celebrating the engagement of two dear friends in the city's gay village, a place we'd always felt safe. My last memory of that moment was how determined I was to drag my wounded body to his. I felt overwhelming weakness but very little pain as my vision became blurred. I managed to rest my head on his chest, his slow beating heart a countdown to unconsciousness. I wish I could say I told him how much he meant to me. The reality is I couldn't speak. Two years later, I was a somewhat reclusive 32-year-old widower with a large scar on the left side of my face, not to mention the ones elsewhere which I can hide. It took me a long time to step outside again, even to walk five minutes to the local shop for bread and milk. Jenna encouraged me to join a gym which was very much needed as I was spending most of my time in the flat. A few weeks in, Jenna pointed out an employee as we were on the treadmills. He's been checking you out for weeks now. I looked over at him, he was staring in our direction with a smile. That guy? I asked. He's clearly a tits man, Jen. That sports bra leaves very little to the imagination. I laughed playfully. Fuck you, she said as she slapped my arm. I swear, his eyes are on you wherever you go. I felt butterflies in my stomach. Really? I looked at him again as he was standing over a client on a bench press. He was very attractive. I went into a semi-trance which was broken as he looked up and raised his hand to say hello. I felt my face burn as I quickly raised my hand and looked down. Real smooth, laughed Jenna. Shut up, I'm out of practice, I said quietly, looking at my trainers. The next time I went to the gym Jenna suggested I go alone. In her words he might approach you without your double D bitch by your side. At first I couldn't see him and felt mild disappointment, but around 20 minutes later there came a hi there from behind me. His name was Ben, a personal trainer. I did my best at making normal human conversation and a bit of flirting, though I was nervous and awkward. Fortunately he saw the funny side, even mentioning he thought it was cute. He confessed that if it hadn't been for Jenna he would have asked me out already, but he hadn't noticed the ring on my left hand until then. I felt a split second of shame as I slowly twirled the white gold band and explained I was very much available for a date. As I left the gym I looked up to the sky. I'm not religious, neither was Ash, but it feels like the right way to address the deceased. I hope you're okay with this. I asked, before making my way to the subway. We met at an Italian restaurant, I was wearing an outfit Jenna helped me shop for. Having opted for comfortable, practical attire since Ash's passing I no longer knew how to dress to impress. I felt like a million dollars and Ben seemed to agree, complimenting me at every opportunity. I told him about Ash, our attack, how he was tragically taken from us before his time. 
Ben was nothing but supportive. I smiled sheepishly as his gaze pierced my soul. When I mentioned my scar and how it somewhat contributed to my lack of confidence, he gently traced it with his index finger. It was the first time I had been touched that way since Ash, it felt like electricity pulsing through my skin. You're beautiful, he said. I felt myself blush as my eyes glazed over. Dates became more frequent and nights became less lonely. The first time we were intimate was like my first time all over again. I trembled but Ben put me at ease. He kissed each of my body scars delicately and told me I was perfect. I rested my head on his chest as he slept in my bed, and my eyes met ashes in the form of a photograph. A picture from a trip to Barcelona stood in a frame on the bedside table, Ash's arms around me high up on Tibidabo. His eyes burned into mine in frozen judgment. I reached over and placed it face down before switching off the lamp, feeling a hint of guilt. The next morning after Ben left for work I took the frame to the storage cupboard, staring at the photograph. Other than our wedding day it was one of my fondest memories. We both fell in love with Barcelona, the people, the food, the architecture. We visited at least once every year we were together. I miss you handsome man, I said out loud. And I'll love you always. I kissed the cool glass within the frame, then opened the cupboard door. I placed the frame in a box of random things that I had never found a home for. I promise I'm not going to forget about you. Ben and I began to see each other almost every day. We'd spend the night together, mostly at my place as it was closer to the city center and the places we hung out. Having been celibate for some time I had a passionate fire inside me, and Ben always obliged. His body was crazy, I often felt I had no right being the object of his desire. Ash would occasionally invade my thoughts, though I pushed him aside and pulled Ben closer. One evening as we laid spooning in bed, I felt lips on the back of my neck slowly move to my ear. Then came a whisper. He's not the one for you. I screamed and sat upright, my skin crawling. It sounded just like Ash. What the fuck did you just say? I screamed at Ben. My hands were trembling. He looked shocked, completely unaware of any wrongdoing. I said goodnight, babe. I could hear the hurt and confusion in his voice. I felt instant guilt, I must have imagined it or been on the edge of a dream. Ash was clearly still very much on my mind no matter how hard I tried to shift him. All I could do was apologize and hope that he didn't think I was crazy. As I began to cry he slowly embraced me, kissing the top of my head. It's okay, he said. I understand this must feel strange for you. It wasn't long until I'd fallen asleep, though I woke up with a jolt as I heard a yell. Fuck! Ben shouted. I reached over and switched on the bedside lamp. He was on the bedroom floor holding his arm. Are you alright? I asked. You fell out of bed? He looked pissed. No, you pushed me. I was asleep, Ben, I said, a little defensively. You pushed me, I felt you do it. I covered my mouth with my hand, shocked. I'm so sorry. I got out of bed and helped him up. If I did, it was subconsciously. He started to rub his upper arm and looked at me, annoyed. Don't worry, I'll get over it. Is your arm okay? I gently touched it and he pulled away. Might have to go easy at work for a few days, but I'll live. I managed to convince him to come back to bed, but I didn't sleep a wink. I apologized again in the morning and made my excuses for the next couple of days. After the way I behaved I think he was happy with a little space. Something clearly wasn't right. I had no intention of ending things or anything dramatic like that, but Ash was clearly still on my mind. I needed to make things less Ash-centric, physically and mentally. I placed an empty box on the floor and packed it with anything that reminded me of him. Pictures, 
ornaments, DVDs. It occurred to me that since Ash had died I hadn't touched our CD collection. Not only because it was painful, but because, well, who really listens to CDs these days? I fell down the rabbit hole and started reminiscing about the music that connected us, and it didn't take long for somewhat happy tears to fall. There were some lovely memories. As I picked up a small stack to put in the box one of them slipped onto the floorboards. Static by Colts. I took in a deep breath, my hand resting on my chest. Colts were a band that one of our friends had introduced us to, we'd both fallen in love with their dreamy sound as we fell in love with each other. Always Forever was our first dance as husbands. I picked up the CD case and walked over to the stereo, which hadn't been used for years. I inserted the disc and skipped to track 3. Music filled the room and my heart. You and me, always forever. I was taken back to our wedding day. Tears fell but I couldn't help but smile. I'm supposed to be clearing my head of you, I said to the room with a sigh, laughing it off. I closed my eyes. There was the slightest sensation of something brushing against my waist, followed by a crash behind me. I screamed and turned on the spot, my heart beating out of my chest. The box I had started to fill was overturned, the contents spilled across the floor. I switched off the music and headed towards the front door, grabbing my keys on the way. I had to get out of the flat. As I took the lift down to the ground floor I took my phone out of my pocket and went to speed dial Ben, but thought better than to bother him with more craziness. Instead, I text Jenna to see if she was free for coffee. We met at the Cafe Nero we frequented after our gym sessions, taking back the lost calories. So, how's it going with Ben? She asked, drinking a chai latte. It's going great, actually, I said. Americano in hand. The best thing about him, he's not one of those dicks you always expect personal trainers to be. She laughed. But has he got the kind of dick you'd expect a personal trainer to have? I almost choked on my coffee. Jen. What? Just asking the real questions. I shook it off. All I'll say on the subject is I'm very happy, alright? good enough for me, she said with a wink. I paused for a moment. Yesterday something weird happened, though. And again today. I was hesitant to open the doors on crazy, especially as it involved her deceased brother. But she told me to spit the fuck out, and that prompted me to tell her what had happened the night before and earlier that day. I hasten to add in all the time that's passed, I've never experienced anything like this. Do you think I'm crazy? She gave me a look as if to say she was thinking about it. Great. Things just start to improve, and then I imagine my dead husband is haunting me. You're not crazy, she said. It's probably some kind of internalized guilt. This is the first time you've been with someone romantically since Ash was taken from us. That was fucking traumatic. It was bound to affect you in some way. I reached out and took her hand. Thank you, Jen. I have been thinking about him more lately. I'm trying not to. She smiled. Best case scenario, this is a totally normal behavior for someone who's been through what you've been through. Worst? Ash is literally haunting you. We both know how jealous he could get. I laughed a little, though the thought gave me goosebumps. Stop it. But yeah, if anyone was gonna come back to scare away the new love interest it'd be Ash. Rest his soul. Jenna left and I hung around for as long as I could before the city made me feel uncomfortable, then I made my way back home. I crept into my flat like a thief, scanning the rooms for anything unusual. The contents of the box were still scattered over the living room floor. I picked them up and continued to pack away anything that reminded me of Ash, I was finished by sundown. That evening when I sat down for dinner, I realized it was the first time I'd eaten alone in some time. 
I decided that being with Ben felt right, and I'd just have to work harder at fighting the invading thoughts of Ash. At least the ones that scared me. I text Ben. How's your arm? Dinner for one is no fun. Sad face. Sorry again for last night, miss you ex. As I started the dishes I received a message notification, drying my hands to read it immediately. It's okay babe honestly. Arm is fine, heat gel did the trick. Got a cheeky macky DS after work, don't judge me. Let's get hot in the kitchen tomorrow, winky face. If you're up for it babe xx. I smiled to myself and replied that I'd love nothing more, thinking how lucky I was to have found someone so understanding. That night I dreamt about Ash, which I was prepared for. There was nothing unusual about that. Though he wasn't his usual charming self. He looked serious, his eyes dark. He was aggressively pulling me away from my bed which Ben slept in. Always forever played quietly in that dreamlike way. Then I awoke, disorientated. I could still hear the music in my head, but it didn't take long to realize that music was actually playing inside the flat. I sat up quickly, pulling my knees to my chest. My heart began to beat faster and my breathing became stuttered. Slowly, I crept out of bed towards the living room. It was dark, but the stereo was lit up. I could see the display bars moving up and down as the music played. You know you've got me in your pocket. I switched on the light and swiftly moved to the stereo, switching the power off. It did nothing. I fell to my knees and scrambled for the wall socket, pulling out the plug. Nothing changed, the anxiety building within me knew it wouldn't. I sat with my back against the wall and held my hands over my ears. Ash. I screamed at the top of my lungs, enough to hurt my throat. Ash. Stop, please. I started to cry, I couldn't deal with what was happening. Eventually I stood up and pushed the stereo off the small cabinet it sat on. It hit the floor with a crash, small pieces broke away and scattered in all directions. The music stopped instantly which took the edge off my panic state. There came some bangs from a flat below and a muffled what the fuck are you doing out there? I laid on the cold floorboards staring at the plain ceiling. I'm not sure how much time went by, I think I might have even slept for a while, but my nerves began to settle enough to get to my feet and slowly walk to the kitchen. I had to step over parts of the stereo that would most likely have broken the skin if trodden on. I put the kettle on and made a cup of sweet tea trying to process everything. My hands were still shaking a little as I slowly brought the cup to my lips, trying not to spill any. Then my eyes fell onto something on the counter and I froze. The framed picture of Ash and I in Barcelona stood upright, a scrap of paper below it with a handwritten note. Please leave him, baby. It was Ash's handwriting. I was done. I grabbed a few items of clothing from my wardrobe and stuffed them into a gym bag with my phone, wallet, and keys. I put my shoes on without doing up the laces and rushed out of my flat. I'd probably seen too many scary movies to make rational decisions, but taking the stairs seemed like the safer option. Lifts usually broke down in those moments. I descended as quickly as possible, it was a miracle that I didn't trip. I didn't stop until I was out of the main building and could feel the cool night air on my face. Only then did I allow myself to sit down on the dirty street and hyperventilate, a couple of late night passers by avoiding me like the plague. With my laces tied I walked away from my building and called Ben. He answered after a few rings, sounding groggy. Hey you, he said. Are you home? I asked. Slight pause. It's almost one, where else would I be? Can I come over? Of course you can, is everything okay? I'll tell you when I get there, see you soon. I hung up without waiting for a response, then headed to the subway to Ben's neighborhood. Thank goodness certain lines were running 24 hours. 
the carriages were mostly empty but I avoided eye contact with a few other passengers. I reached his flat's building some 20 minutes later and pressed the buzzer, waiting for entry. Keeping with the paranoid theme I took the stairs, it was four flights and I was pretty drained by the time I got to his door. Ben was there to greet me and I collapsed into his arms, crying. He held me up in his strong embrace but I heard him wince slightly due to his injury. Hey, he said, stroking the back of my head. It's alright. Come inside. He made peppermint tea, we sat on his comfortable sofa and I told him about what had been going on. He listened intently and nodded where he was supposed to. So, yeah. Apparently Ash doesn't want me to be with you. I'm completely aware of how fucking crazy this is and I will accept any reaction. He took a deep breath. That's a lot to take in, babe. I can't even begin to understand how you must be feeling. But whatever's going on, I want to help you. He put his hand on my leg and I covered it with mine, it made me feel warm inside. Thank you, that means so much to me. As I looked into his kind eyes it suddenly dawned on me. I hadn't felt this way since those first few months of Ash and I. I love you, Ben. He beamed, his grip on my leg tightened. Fuck, I love you too, he said, kissing me. We hugged each other tight. And I meant it when I said I want to help. I know one way that would help you right now. I laughed a little. Sex isn't the answer to everything, Ben. But I guess it could help. He sighed and pulled away slightly, looking me in the eyes. There was a flash of something dark and his smile was unsettling. That's not what I meant, babe. Without warning his hands closed around my neck and he pushed his whole body weight on top of me, pinning me down on the sofa. My hands gripped his wrists, trying to free myself but the shock of it had rendered me weak. I stared into his hateful eyes, mine wide with fear and confusion. Ben, please. He grinned bearing his perfect teeth. Please what? He hissed. Help you? I am babe. I'll put you out of your fucking misery. I reached up and hit his bad arm as hard as I could, it was pathetic. He groaned a little but just tightened his grip. He was physically bigger and considerably stronger. I couldn't breathe. Don't fight it babe, he spat. I'm doing you a service putting an end to your fucking delusions. I never could have predicted this. Ben had always been such a kind and gentle soul. As I started to lose consciousness an air of calm washed over me. Ash was taken from me by a cruel act of violence, and it seemed I was to share the same fate. There was some kind of fucked up poetry in that. Memories flashed before me. How we'd met by chance. We were on opposite sides of the road in a traffic jam, sharing a brief conversation through our car windows. There was clearly a spark, and I spent days thinking about him afterwards. Then we bumped into each other at a bar, spending the rest of the evening together and much of the next morning. Moving into our flat, making it our home. Falling in love with the streets of Barcelona. The first time I could call him my husband. Then music began to play. Ben looked up, a look of surprise on his face. What the fuck, he yelled, his grip letting up slightly. Then his hands left my neck completely and he jumped up from the sofa, allowing me to breathe. There appeared to be no specific source for the music, it just manifested in the room. You and me, always forever. I sat up choking, one hand on my neck, slightly disorientated. Then my eyes fell onto Ben, or what I assumed was Ben. But as I focused it looked like someone else. He quickly turned and left the room. Wait! I shouted, my throat sore. I got up and stumbled after him, the music following me down the hallway. He stood in the kitchen leaning against the counter, his back to me. He wore the same clothes as Ben but the back of his head and general body proportions were different. I. Ash? 
he stood upright and slowly turned, facing me. His smile was ever so slight, but it lit up his handsome face. I gasped, covering my mouth with a trembling hand as tears streamed. Hello, my darling, he said. I hesitantly stepped closer, expecting it to be a trick of the light. My oxygen deprived brain playing tricks on me. But the closer I got, the more clear he became. Is. Is it really you? I reached out and lightly touched the side of his face. He closed his eyes and sighed, reaching up to cover my hand. He nodded. It's me, baby. Well, kind of. I broke down and he embraced me. His arms felt like home, it was both calming and overwhelming. I nuzzled into his neck and could smell the subtle scent of black orchid, the only fragrance he ever wore. We began to slowly move to our song as it continued to play. We could stay alone together. I pulled away and delicately stroked his face with my fingertips, trying to absorb as many details as possible. Where's Ben? I asked. He's in here, he said, tapping his chest. I could explain it but we really don't have much time. I nodded. There was so much I wanted to tell you, I said, my eyes filling up again. That night, when we... Shush, he said, holding the sides of my head. I know everything you wanted to say, and it means the world to me. He gently traced the scar on my face and smiled. One thing I've got in common with this psychotic cunt, we sure know a beautiful man when we see one. I let out a laugh which made me cough a little. Ash lightly touched my neck. Baby, he's gonna pay for that. I'll call the police, I said, nodding. He shook his head. No, that's not enough. It's not the first time he's done something like this. Not even the second. The others weren't so lucky. I covered my mouth. Oh God, those poor guys. He grabbed my shoulders. I don't have long, baby. He's fighting it. As soon as I let you go, you grab your bag and leave. Do you understand? My heartbeat began to increase in speed as I took in a deep breath and nodded. I understand. Will I ever see you again? He pressed his forehead against mine. I can't say for sure. Truthfully, I don't understand half of this afterlife shit myself. I laughed again, followed by more tears. That's good enough for me, handsome. He leaned in and kissed me, I felt like I was on air. When he pulled away there was a flicker in his eyes, and they changed from light blue to hazel. I gasped. His face all at once became serious. Remember, grab your shit and go. Don't hang around, don't ever come back here. He threw his head back and groaned. It was multi-layered, I could hear the unmistakable sound of Ben too. Ash! I screamed, panicking. I felt our brief time together coming to an abrupt end. He looked at me, fighting it. It was the strangest thing, his face would intermittently blur and be replaced by Ben's. His grip on my shoulders began to hurt, then he let me go. Get out of here, he said, turning to the counter and pulling out a large kitchen knife from a wooden block. I started taking steps back as he held the blade against his neck. I miss you, I said, sniveling. He just stared intently and motioned to the door with his head. I turned to leave the kitchen. Baby, he called after me. I looked over my shoulder. You and me, he smiled. I smiled back. Always forever. I grabbed my bag and rushed for the front door, hearing a heart-stopping scream as I pulled it open. Then I ran into the cool night. It was the first time in years that the potentially evil things within it were the last thing on my mind. That was all for today. Glad you guys listened till the end. Don't forget to like the video and share with your friends.
Also send in your own scary stories at horrorxperiencemedia at gmail.com, so your work can get featured in my videos. You can find the link in the description. Subscribe for more similar stories and see you guys in the next video.